Hello, and uh, welcome to the Foresight Centre's webinar that is titled, Who Should Pay the Higher Education Bill? We are really happy to have a foreign guest today, and therefore this seminar will be in English, but I make a brief uh, introduction in uh, Estonian, and then we will continue in English. <clears throat> Head uh, seminar osalejad, arenguse ja keskuse, selle aasta üheks uurimis suunaks on kõrgharjuduse tulevik. Ja selle uurimis suunaga me selgitame kõrgharjuduse trende ja tuleviku suundumisi, mõtleme läbi, millised on neist tulenevad võimalikud senaariumid ning tegelikult kolmanda suurema uurimisteemana selgitame kõrgharjuduse rahastamise mudeleid ja nende tuleviku kindlust. Et see kõrgkoolide ja kõrgharjuduse rahastamise küsimus on väga tugevalt päevakorral ja see on teravlenud olukorrani, kus kõrgkoolide rektori ei ole enam valmis sõlmima riigiga halduslepinguid praeguse rahastuse tasemel. Ja avaliku sektori kõrgharjuduskulude osakaal SKP-st või sisemajanduse kogutoodangust on langenud 1,1% juurde ning kõrgkoolide hinnangul on praeguse süsteemiga jätkamise korral vaja jõuda selleni, et et rahastus kasvaks eurovõrra aastas. Avalikus diskussioonis on arutatud erinevate võimaluste üle, kas ja kuidas kõrgharjuduse rahastamisega edasi minna Eestis. Ja tänasel seminaaril selgitamegi kõrgharjuduse rahastamise suundumusi Euroopa riikides ja kuidas see suhestub nende trendidega siis Eesti kõrgharjudusõppe rahastamise süsteem. Loodan väga, et see seminaar pakub uusi mõtteid kõrgharjuduse rahastamise debatti. Lisan veel, et esinejatele on võimalik esitada küsimusi ja kindlasti julgustan seda võimalust ka kasutama, et kui te vaatate siis Zoomi akna alumises servas, leiati kooni Q&A küsimused ja vastused, kuhu saate siis oma küsimused kirja panna. Lisan veel, et me lindistame tänase arutelu ja see lindistus on on hiljem leitav arenguseere keskuse kodulehekülje pealt ja tegelikult ka Facebooki lehe pealt. Ma jätkan nüüd siis inglise keeles. Dear speakers, dear participants, I am really glad to welcome all of you at today's webinar. This webinar contributes to our foresight project of the future of higher education in Estonia. The purpose of the, the project is threefold, so to say. First, um, we explore the trends and also uncertainties that are driving the, the future of higher education. Second, we create a set of scenarios describing the, the different uh, possibilities of the education, higher education in 2035. And the third, and also very topical issue, is the, the financing models of higher education. And we will dis uh, discuss today that uh, the level of uh, state financing to the higher education has been in decline in Estonia. And there is a public debate how to, how to continue basically, and what is the, the long-term approach, how to make this uh, financing model future-proof. I, I also say that uh, the Foresight project is ongoing and uh, we are presenting the final results at the end of the May or maybe at the beginning of June. So a couple of months to, to finalize the results. So today's uh, seminar gives us a better understanding of the trends of higher education financing in OECD countries. What are the main principles and how it has uh, changed? Also, what is the, the outlook for the future? We can uh, then later discuss how this Estonian system is uh, positioning towards these uh, trends. And I am really pleased to have good speakers today. The, the main speech will be delivered by Professor Christoph de Witte. Uh, Christoph is a professor in education, economics, and political economy at the Catholic University of Leuven. He is uh, also holding a chair at Maastricht University. He has published more than uh, 100 papers in the web of science publications in the fields of education, economics, performance, evaluation, and political economy. So we are really happy to have you here and uh, presenting at our webinar. The, the second presentation will be delivered jointly by Kaira Böder and uh, Trin Lauri. Kaira is a full professor at the Student Business School 
She has published in several high-level journals in the fields of uh, higher education economics and uh, education financing. And uh, Trin Lauri is an associate professor of public policy at the University of Tallinn and reviewer in, in several international journals. We have really high quality panel today. And I'm also pleased to announce that we have a member of Estonian parliament, uh, former minister of uh, education and science, and also former minister of uh, finance, Mr. Jürgen Ligi, who is going to reflect his views on the topic. But uh, I think now I give, give the floor to, or actually the Zoom window, to Professor Kairaböder, uh, who is our lead expert on, on higher education financing, and who is going to, to lead today's webinar and uh, going to facilitate the discussion after the presentations. So please, Kairaböder, Zoom is yours for the opening words. Thank you, Ko. It is, of course, a pleasure to be here. And it was pretty funny that you revealed the number of web uh, publications in the case of Christoph, but somehow hide the number of publications in the case of Estonian females. So, <laughs> but yeah, of course, I have the honor to lead this uh, session today. I know Christoph quite many years already. And, and um, the opening words from my behalf as coming from the perspective that, of course, the political debates in higher education that is always kind of going to the direction that there is no enough money. And also voters kind of <laughs> don't deny this, uh, this often as well, what Dean will debate later on in this uh, uh, broadcast today. But uh, what we sometimes forget about is that it's not only a question how much, but it's also a question of how. And by that, I mean, what are the systems of financing or mechanism of financing of universities? And not only university financing is the issue, but also student financing, which we often here in Estonia, if not neglect, maybe it's exaggeration, but at least we don't debate it too often. So, so far we are, we Estonians do policy borrowing mainly from Finland. So I guess now it's time to look at the other countries. And Christoph is coming from Flemish region, if I'm pronouncing English words correct, I guess in Estonia it's Flamish. So, so it's a part of Belgium. Uh, uh, if you take the plane, it will take two and a half hours uh, and then a bit of the train. So it's as far away from us as uh, as Brussels, so Leuven uh, is, the, is the core where Christoph is right now, isn't it? So welcome, and um, the agenda is the following. You have your 45 minutes, and then we take the screen from you. So please um, take over, steal the screen, upload your slides, and um, I try not to intervene and mute myself starting from now on. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Gary and Uko, for the invitation uh, for the seminar. So indeed, I'm Christoph de Wette from uh, Leuven University in Belgium. Um, you can find the slides. So in the slides, there will be quite a bit of um, information and quite a bit of data. Uh, so if you go to this website, fab.skyleuven.be slash leer, you will be able to download the slides from there and to have an, um, yeah, I only have 45 minutes. So if you were eager to, to dig deeper into the slides and into the numbers, uh, feel free to download them uh, from this place. Uh, so I'm indeed uh, part of Leuven Economics of Education Research, which is an, uh, in a research group focusing on um, education, but looking to education from an economic perspective. And that's, of course, why I was very happy to see the invitation um, to discuss a little bit the funding mechanisms in higher education. And um, I would like to compare in the, in the next 45 minutes a little bit um, the system in Estonia to the system in Flanders, uh, this Flemish case, uh, because I think it's a very didactic case. Um, the OECD says uh, Estonia is comparable uh, jurisdiction to Flanders, and so we share a lot of common elements. Um, also, in, in terms of secondary education financing, for instance, uh, we consider typically Estonia as a kind of best practice um, in terms of funding, in terms of um, how the, the outcomes are. And that's why I think that um, yeah, this didactic case of comparing Flanders um, towards other OECD systems towards Estonia might be uh, very relevant. 
And um, a lot of the information and background doc documents arise from this um, document here. It's a very recent publication from the OECD. So if you're eager to, or if you would like to know more about the, the mechanisms, uh, about the specific case, um, have a look at this, um, at this publication. So what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes is uh, first setting the scheme a little bit. Huh? So what about the finding? What, uh, what about um, the, the funding as such? Um, what about spending, public spending in higher education? How is um, education spent? What are the issues in higher education? Next, I'm going to, de to become more in detail uh, looking at the funding models. So what, um, how is education, higher education typically funded? And what about performance-based funding? What is the issue in performance-based funding and what can we learn or can't we learn from that? And then finally, I'll come to the, an, an issue which um, plays a lot in Estonia. Um, it's a broad access to higher education. How can we look at uh, grants to loans um, in, in higher education funding and how can we open higher education for as many pe people as possible? Okay, so first, um, public spending in higher education. And so you see that um, in many countries, there is a considerable amount of money going from the, the public budgets, uh, the overall government, towards uh, tert tertiary education. In Flanders or in Belgium here, uh, this is Belgian data, about 83% of the total budgets for higher education is coming from public resources. In Estonia, as you will see in this blue bar, um, it's about 70%. And so about 70% of the, of the budget in Estonia um, is coming from the public budget. And that's more than, as you see, the OECD average. If you then look to the education per student, because of course um, this matters as well, you see that there's quite a bit of variety. Um, and again, I'll highlight the, the Flemish case with the Estonian case, but you see here the um, expenditures per student, and you see that the, the overall expenditure per student is about 30% lower in Estonia than it is in Flanders. Um, it's slightly below the OECD average um, in Estonia. Um, Flanders is way above this OECD average in terms of uh, spending um, to, uh, per student, but in both Flanders as well as uh, in Estonia, you see that the majority of the spending is coming from this government. Huh? So the, the blue bar, um, it's, it's considerably higher than the other bars. Um, in Flanders, there's only tuition fees, which adds up to that. In Estonia, it's a bit more diverse, but you see that the majority of the funding um, is coming from uh, public money and uh, that it's considerably lower in Estonia than in uh, other countries, or at least than in Flanders. If you deal, delve a little bit deeper into those numbers, so these are the same numbers here, but um, yeah, split a bit differently. So here I split this, or this, this OECD graph is splitting this according to the destination of funds. So what about the money and where is the money going from? And you see that the money in Flanders here, again, this red area, um, is mainly going to um, the spending, the overall spending, um, the, to, the teaching, etc., and about 34% is going um, to about 40% is going to R&D, uh, so to research and development. If you compare this again to Estonia, you see that in Estonia, the part for research and development is a bit lower. Uh, so it's about 34% compared to the 40% in Flanders. Um, but that also this private spending is much more higher. Uh, so you see that about 70% is coming from tuition fees um, and, and all kind of other private elements. Whereas in Flanders, this is only 6%. So we do have very low tuition fees in Flanders, about 970 euros. Um, so it's, it's really the idea of having open access to people, low tuition fees, um, but um, people can just enroll and then the government is uh, spending a lot of money on that. I'll come back to this in a moment. But you see, so um, in terms of what is going on with the money, there is a little bit of difference and um, Estonia is not very different from other countries in that perspective, but slightly different from Flanders. Um, in the sense of uh, less money to research and development. And then if you look a little bit to the trends, the evolution over time. So here is the evolution between 2012 and 2017. And uh, definitely in Flanders, if you compare to other countries, you see that this private share in spending is increasing. And so we, we ask more money to students, tuition fees um, are increasingly uh, considered as a way to to see uh, also equity, uh, so uh, to safeguard sufficient funding. Uh, so we have this open system, everybody can enroll in higher education. Um, typically this was with very low tuition fees and now this is gradually a bit um, increased such that the, the importance, and I'll come back to this at the end of the presentation, the importance of loans and grants is increasing. Uh, so um, we have 
to, to safeguard a little bit to, to compensate or to compensate a little bit this tuition fees there are um, loans and, and grants but you see that um, and that's the, the the yellow bar here there is a, 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 a strong um, increase in private spending um, there is an, a strong increase also in uh, research and development. And so in Flanders, we consider ourselves as a knowledge intensive economy. So we would like to do a lot of research, a lot of R&D, a lot of spin-offs of universities. And of course, um, this is funded by the government in terms of fundamental research, um, which is growing rapidly over time, more than many other countries. Whereas the core um, public spending on, on core services um, on teaching, for instance, is slightly decreasing over time. And so you see a slight change over time towards uh, the spending pattern. And that's um, quite different from other countries. So I can already mentioned Finland, for instance. So in Finland, you see that there is a massive decrease in public spending on, um, on, on core and auxiliary services. And there is also this decrease in private spending and a decrease in the public spending on R&D. So you see that education systems um, they tend to differ a bit in terms of um, how the, the system evolves over time. What we do have in common with uh, Estonia and Flanders is as well um, the issues. So uh, both in Estonia as well as in Flanders, we do have relatively low graduation um, in time. So the, at the first three years of a cycle, the, the nominal duration of an, a nominal bachelor degree, for instance, uh, we have only 30%, a little bit more than 30% of the students who is graduating on time. And that's, of course, due in Flanders to this open access system. So everybody can enroll, whether you're coming from a vocational track in secular education, from a technical education track, or from a pre-university track, everybody can just start in higher education, both at universities as well as in universities of applied science. So it's completely open. Um, but you see that, of course, this comes at the cost of having low um, low and low graduation in time. If you look a little bit um, beyond the first due time, so that's the, the, the bars here. So it's the, the nominal duration plus three years. So both in Flanders as well in Estonia, you see that this rises up to almost 70%. So that's slightly better. Um, but still, of course, it's an, it's an issue because yeah, similar delays are costly. So it's, it's a very significant cost for the education system to have a delay and to, um, to, to, to fund yeah, students for multiple years in addition. But that's something we have in common. And it's, of course, um, also an element, a design element of the, of the system on how you perceive the system and how you fund the system. Another element that we have in common is that, yeah, if you have this degree, if you have a higher education degree, yeah, it matters on the labor market. So both in Flanders as well as in Estonia or in, in Belgium, these are Belgian data, you see that uh, the degree matters. So this is the employment rates of young people, so 25 to 34 years old, by their graduation program. And if you are graduated from university, for instance, from tertiary education, you see that both in Estonia as well as in Flanders, you have very high probabilities of having a good job later on, good earnings. So these are just employment rates, but earnings, of course, are higher. Um, and this differs differently in the, in the Belgian case. So you see that this, this bar is much longer. And so if you have a vocational coming from a uh, below um, upper secondary, so if you're a school dropout, then um, you, you don't have very good prospects on the labor markets. This differs a bit in Estonia, where almost everybody has good prospects. So even school dropouts uh, but of course the the higher the degree the better you um, end up uh, on the labor markets and that's of course showing the the importance of higher education uh, in terms of yeah individual employment rates individual earnings etc okay this was just to, to overview a little bit to get you a little bit into the context and into the topic um, and to just to set a scene and now we're going to have a look to the to the funding mechanisms uh, model so um, the funding mechanisms, there are basically three big blocks that you can look at. And so first you can, of course, look at the private components. The private components, it's, it's driven by the demand side, and these are mainly the tuition fees. And so people, they pay if they enter a university or if they enter the University of Applied Sciences. Um, and the tuition fees, of course, they end up in the private component, what I just showed you a moment ago. Um, but of course, definitely in the Flemish case, this is heavily regulated and we can't ask as a university more than this 979 euros for a full program for 60 ECTS points. 
which is about this five, six percent of the budgets that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, but so that's kind of regulated by the governments in, in the, definitely in Flanders, but also in many other countries. But that's one mechanism, of course, to, to raise money out of students. A second mechanism to raise money out of students is um, by getting money from the government. It's the public spending. And this can be either supplier oriented, so in which the money directly flows to the institution. So the operating grant is directly given from the government to the institution, or this can be demand oriented. And in a demand oriented system, it's the, it's the student who gets the money. And the students, they, they just spend the money to the institutions um, in which they enroll. And that's, for instance, the case in, in Lithuania. Yeah, so Lithuania is one of the, I come to this in a moment, but one of the education systems which have this demand-oriented mechanisms in which the money um, is given to the student and then the student is spending it. And in most other countries, we do have supplier-oriented mechanisms in which the, the government is immediately giving it the grant to the, um, uh, to, to the institution. If you have then this supplier-oriented mechanism, also, which is the most common um, mechanism, so typically, there is a kind of block grant given to the institution. Right? So it's a fixed amount of money, kind of lump sum given to the institution. And then the institution can do whatever it wants with this amount of money. And so it can pay people, it can pay professors, a secretary, etc. So it's up to the institution, that's lump sum. So the government is not earmarking it. So they don't say you have to use it for this or that. Um, but it's up to the institution. And typically, this is composed of several uh, elements. So typically, there is, for instance, a waiting mechanism to see um, how should we invest the capital investments and the building, um, the infrastructure, the ICT infrastructure, etc. That's typically specific grants for capital investments. Next to that, there are typically grants for research, in which, for instance, publications counts, in which, for instance, PhDs counts, um, the type of publications, and based on those publications on PhDs, etc., institutions they get more or less money. And that's a specific uh, grants for research. And then third, the majority of the grant, of course, the large part of the grants is giving to the teaching and institutional operations. Um, and that's what we call this, this basic grant, uh, which is the, the largest part uh, in most uh, education systems. And so here in this graph, you can see a little bit how this is divided. So for both the Flemish community, so we see that in universities and university colleges, so that's University of Applied Sciences, this teaching grant is the, yeah, for universities of applied sciences, they do have less research. So almost all of the budget is coming from this basic grant for teaching, 94%. In universities, this is almost half of the budget is coming from this teaching. Half of the budget in the Flemish case is coming from the research. And that's very similar to other education systems. So if you look at uh, Denmark, for instance, if you look at Finland, for instance, so 42% is coming to the teaching, 34% uh, is going to the research grants, and then there are also some specificities based on the um, education system. Okay, so you see, so that's a little bit how this structure is built. So you do have, in terms of mechanisms, so private money to the to the tuition fees, and then if you are oriented, it's supplier-oriented mechanisms, demand-oriented. In the supplier mechanisms, there is a block grant and a large amount of money, which is then come up with the weights, etc., on uh, on the institution and, and given on the on the teaching. Question is, of course, how should we construct something like that? Uh, and because, of course, that's the real funding mechanisms. Um, that's typically with formulas, etc. Uh, but there are different systems, different ways of how education systems see those um, construction of this budget envelope. Eh? So this amount of money, this block grant is typically divided in different ways. And so first of all, you can, of course, say we do have a particular budget. And that's, for instance, what happens in Denmark, in Scotland and Australia. We do have a particular amount of budget. And so that means that we have a maximum number of students. And so in those education systems, so both in Denmark, um, in uh, Scotland and Australia, they fund a maximum number of students. In Lithuania, the same thing. Um, they fund a maximum amount of students based on the merit. So um, students who qualify and do have particular merits, have particular grades, etc. They don't have, they don't um, pay fees. And that's what the government is paying. So that's based on enrollment uh, measures. And that's like a fixed cost for students, such that this is a closed envelope. So the, the government determines a priori in advance 
what is the budget that we're going to allocate and they do know the number of students of course and as such that's the, the budget they allocate to higher education second way is then this demand driven this demand driven in which you just assign uh, an amount of money to students and then the student can divide it uh, but of course um, in a similar demand driven system that's of course yeah it, it can increase rapid, dr dramatically so uh, like in australia for instance they started with a similar demand driven system um, but if the number of students is increasing rapidly yeah also the budget has to follow and of course um, this has very high program costs and that's why in australia they they already stopped with similar demand driven uh, system in the in england that's still the case so there's still a demand driven system in which it's quite open and then the um, yeah it's uh, the government is following basically the students and then third, a third system is a distributed process in which there is a kind of fixed envelope which is distributed among the institutions. So in the Flemish case, for instance, there are five universities in Flanders and then the universities, they distribute this amount of money based on a number of criteria. And it happens the same in Finland, it happens the same in the Netherlands, um, in which you have a closed envelope again, so a fixed budget, which is then, um, which is then um, distributed to, to a number of students, okay? And so, for instance, in this Flemish case, you see here, there's this kind of semi-open budget. That's because in the Flemish case, we have a very specific element. It's what we call a click system. Click system because if you have more students, in the first 2% of more students, the budget is still fixed. But if the number of students increases by more than 2% over the years, then we go to a next level of budget uh, of funding. And so um, if the number of students increases over time, the system follows gradually over time. So in the beginning, of course, it's the kind of institutions who have to come up with scale economies to account for that. But after a while, um, it's the budget who follows or which is followed. And this creates what we call here this kind of, sorry, it's the wrong side, what we call this kind of closed or semi-open budget envelope. And so it's a quite unique system in Flanders, thanks to this click system in which um, it's fixed to a given amount, uh, to a certain uh, extent. And so uh, if the number of students increase dramatically, it follows uh, the number of students. Okay, um, but how, the question is still, yeah, if you have a similar distributive process, how do you distribute the money again? Uh, so. It doesn't work with enrollment limits. Enrollment limits are to some extent a bit unfair. Uh, I think it's it's um, it's not always what you would like to do to fund a maximum amount of students. The demand-driven side is also a bit of uh, difficulties because it creates this huge program cost. The distributive process that's that's in some sense a nice process because you 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 have this amount of money which you then distribute through the universities and universities of applied sciences. In Flanders, for instance, we have this. Uh, system, this distributive process, and in which there is a kind of formula behind. And the formula is based on a set of parameters, which you discuss in advance with the higher education institutions. And they know that, for instance, um, there are both input measures as well as output measures. Input measures means that as soon as a student enrolls for the first 60 credits in the program, then this, the university will uh, receive an, an amount of money. It's just a little bit of money, but it's to guarantee this open access. And so we do have this open access. Everybody can enroll. And so we compensate the universities and the University of Applied Sciences for this entry of students. Um, it's only a small amount of money which is going to this input measure. And so students enrolling and taking up credits. The large amount of money and the, the, the majority of the weights and the funding in this formula uh, and this funding formula is going to output measures. And so universities and universities of applied science, they receive more money if they um, succeed and if students graduate and students, they, they need to have some, um, some criteria to be fundable. But as long as students receive the credits and obtain the program in the end, after a couple of years, then the universities and the institutions, they receive more money. Um, so based on the outcome and the output, based on the output of the students, uh, so they, they receive the credits. And next, of course, there are also other output measures, such as the number of PhDs, the number of publications, citations, etc. So um, uh, what's, uh, if you publish, for instance, in better journals, uh, if you publish more, um, we get a larger part of this pile of money and a larger part of the budget. But of course, it's competition. It's a competition between universities because there is this fixed amount of money, um, depending on the click system, but still fixed. And that's the way you distribute the money according to the universities. 
Okay. Um, what else you have? Um, it's kind of degressive weighting in the sense that, yeah, um, to, to one of the criteria of a good higher education funding is that it's kind of predictable and that it doesn't change one year by another year. So it should go a little bit, it should be a bit steady over time. And um, to make sure that it is steady, there is a kind of degressive weighting in the sense that what happened in the past also counts but it counts to a lesser extent. And that's what the degressive weights are. The, the past still matters the, the last five years, but they, they, it diminishes in terms of uh, extent. So if you have a massive intake in terms of students, for instance, in the past, it still might matter in the budget, but um, only um, to a lesser extent than what it happens today. Okay. So that's the, the, the distributive process on how you can distribute it. The fund, the, it's based on a formula, it's based on weights. And of course, that's up to the politicians. It's up to the, the parliament to decide on what are the weights, how do we play with that? But that's, of course, a nice thing. It's predictable. Um, it's right, rather steady. And you can, um, you can play with that, of course. Um, in many countries, they do have this kind of formula. Um, that's a kind of overview of what happens in, in, in a number of OECD countries. Um, here, this was a questionnaire among 27 OECD jurisdictions, and so regions like the Flemish region, um, Scottish region, etc., in which they ask what, what kind of measures are you including in this kind of formula-based model? And then you see that it depends massively across uh, institutions and across jurisdictions. So that might be inspiring for the Estonian case as well. But so it, it varies between um, real earnings. So what are the earnings of the students? Um, and so that's a real outcome, of course. So that doesn't really have to do something with higher education. It's really already on the labor market. So that's not an output of higher education, but an outcome of the higher education system. And that's, for instance, um, the case um, in, in one country here, in one jurisdiction. It can have a look to the um, employment. So if you think as a society, employment matters. So you can include this in the formula. Uh, feedback, completion rates, etc. So there is a quite a bit of number and uh, quite a bit of outcomes, outputs uh, that matter in, uh, in similar jurisdictions. But you see overall that out of the 27 jurisdictions which has been asked, that um, in 18 of them, yeah, the number of credits, uh, the study credits, and the research income discounts more. And the more you have from the, those things, the more uh, you receive in the, the funding formula. Just to give you an idea, for instance, um, to compare Estonia again with uh, Flanders. So um, here you see that uh, also in the, in, so he's, you see the Flemish case, so both universities, you see that this matters a bit for the inputs. So what kind of inputs do you use, activity elements? Most of the budget is going to the outcomes and the outputs, uh, the outputs, uh, so uh, credits, et cetera, none to the outcomes, which are labor market outcomes, et cetera. This only happens, for instance, in Denmark, um, but also in Estonia. So in Estonia, there are um, a few performance indicators, 3% um, for performance agreements. I'll come to this in a moment. Um, none of this is for inputs activities in Estonia, and then 6% for outputs indicators. Uh, well, that's, and that's quite an exception if you compare it to other countries. Quite a bit of the money is going from historical reasons. Uh, and so that's quite rare if you compare it to other um, in, situ in other uh, jurisdictions and other settings. Okay, so this, of course, um, gives you a bit of an idea on, on how this works and how the funding can be distributed through, um, through, it, through universities, to higher education institutions. But of course, there are also alternative models. Eh? So there is um, the alternative model of, for instance, um, institutional performance agreements. Um, the, the alternative model of, for instance, looking at system-wide performance goals, uh, like the employment rates in Denmark. Um, and you see, so it, it varies considerably across, you know, across uh, institutions and across um, yeah, uh, jurisdictions, how this works. Eh? So like in the Danish situation, for instance, um, both with out puts an outcome with also a separate budget envelope for those outcome, uh, outcome indicators. Um, in Flanders, it's only the outcome um, and outputs indicators that, that matter. Okay. So this brings me to this third part of the presentation. So as I said, the basic grant and how the basic grant is allocated, this varies considerably. And one of the elements are the performance agreements, performance agreements, which are also to some extent, as I showed here, uh, in place in the Estonian case. So the, the 3%. Question is, 
yeah, what is the impact of that? And what are the experiences abroad? And I'm going to highlight a few experiences abroad. Um, and I'm starting with the Dutch case. Um, I know this case very well because I was part of this kind of review committee who had to assign 5% of the budgets from the higher education institutions towards the, towards, um, the, the institutions. So we were a very rich institution. And so we had to, to, to discuss with, with, the, um, uh, with the universities, with the University of Applied Sciences on how to allocate this 5%. And so what we did is um, they had to create a kind of performance agreements. And so each university and each University of Applied Sciences had to say between 2012 and 2017, what they would achieve in terms of indicators. So for instance, we would reduce the dropout in the first year by that amount of students. We would increase graduation. We would reduce the switch between institutions. We would increase in the national student survey yeah, to, to, to uh, signal the satisfaction, et cetera. And so universities and uh, University of Applied Sciences, they were asked to create their own targets. And we were judging whether those targets were ambitious and realistic. And based on that, they received money. And as well in 2017, then we checked as the review committee whether they fulfilled the, the questions and whether they, they met the agreements and their own targets that they've set in 2012. And based on that, they received a punishment or they received additional money. And you see here, it's in Dutch, but you see here that there were quite a bit of indicators. And so the seven indicators. And then, um, so these are the indicators in which the ambitions were met. And then there were the ambitions um, that were discussed. And then you see, of course, it's varied quite a bit. So some institutions, they met all ambitions, which were very ambitious. Other ones, they didn't meet the very ambitious. And as such, there was a division of the money. And these were like the, the agreements and the, the distributive process as part of this performance agreements. OK, that's a Dutch case. Um, this Dutch case, um, this, the main advantage of this, this was this increased transparency and in funding of higher education dramatically and what's, what's going on in institutions. Because the institutions, they have to signal their targets. They had to signal their ambitions for both teaching, research, and valorization. Um, and there was a kind of open discussion, thanks to this review committee, which published every year, like, the, the, the agreements and, and the evolution, etc. So this increased transparency in higher education dramatically. There were also positive effects on the organization and the strategic focus because the, the, the government asked the institutions to have a strategic focus. And so it's institutions to really discuss on what they would like to do. Would you like to excel in biomedical sciences and economics um, and, and, and R&D, et cetera. So there was a kind of strategic focus. Uh, it increases the pass rates, uh, the completion rates, um, but not in University of Applied Sciences. And so in the second generation of performance agreements, this was slightly adapted, um, such that there was a kind of bonus for the institutions. There was no punishment anymore, but just a bonus. And so this was um, the new finding. And there was more um, room for qualitative assessment rather than quantitative indicators. Okay, but that's a Dutch case. And so one case of clear performance agreements in higher education, um, in which of course the government has a lot of leeway to, to highlight what it thinks it is important. Huh? Second case is in the US. In the US, um, there were also some performance agreements in 41 of the 50 states with uh, proportions from 3% as in Estonia to 100% um, in some states. Um, but of course, also there, there was a meta-analysis um, they didn't find strong impact in this meta-analysis on the impact of performance-based funding. Um, so they didn't see a strong impact on retention and graduation. They saw that the selective institutions became more selective because of course, if your budget depends on what you agree with and the targets, yeah, it might matter for your incentives and what you effectively do. So they saw that this selectivity in higher education become, uh, became more outspoken. And then uh, third, that um, the, the funding disparities exaggerated. And that's of course the same thing that we saw in the Netherlands. Yeah, if some of the institutions receive, like here, if some of the institutions receive more money, other ones decrease their budget. Yeah, the, the, the inequality in between institutions varied and increased. And that's what, one of the reasons that also the second generation worked with a bonus rather than with uh, punishments. And the same finding was observed in the US. Um, if, of course, there are more disparities, uh, if there are more issues, then um, you see a large inequality among in, uh, institutions. 
overall finding in his literature on performance-based funding is that, yeah, if the narrower the set of the outputs, yeah, the more challenging it is. Yeah? So if it's a very small set of indicators, like the seven indicators in, in, in the Netherlands, you get all attention to those seven indicators. If this is a broader set, it's easier to accommodate and to, to discuss and to, to look at um, as an institution. The Flemish case, um, it's not a performance-based funding in the sense of the US or in, uh, in the sense of uh, the Netherlands, but it still links with this output uh, models. Uh, so we, we still have this output financing and the weights in the, for, in the formula and the funding formula are quite high for output indicators. And that's why, yeah, it's, it's also a kind of uh, output linked funding model. What we do find um, based, so if you if you compare what happened before the funding mechanism was in place, after the funding mechanism was in place, is that it didn't lead to an improvement in the progression and completion rates. So completion rates, as I showed you in the beginning, are still relatively low. 30% of the students completing in time in the three years, 70% after three additional years. Um, so there, it didn't really change the short-term impacts. We see over time that due to this open intake of students, that the time to, to degree increases. So it takes longer and longer and longer for students to obtain the, the, the bachelor degree and to obtain the master degree. Uh, we also see a rise in the dropout rates of um, bachelor students. And um, we see also an increase in the degree seeking students. So there is an increase in the number of students in universities. And of course, in this Flemish case, there are a few specificities, specificities that might matter um, in the sense that yeah, for the institutions, it doesn't really matter when students um, are finishing. Uh, they anyway receive the money if the student is finishing, if it's in time or if it's one year later or two years later or three years later, it doesn't really matter. So in that sense, there is no incentive for the institutions. There is also no incentive for students themselves. So students, it's an open access system, 900 euros entry, so tuition fee. So it's not that expensive uh, for most parents. It's, it's expensive, but not, um, not, over, uh, not overcomable for most parents. Um, and so there is few reasons for students to, um, to think very hard or not to switch, for instance, or to, to take your chances. Um, and a lot of students, they have spare credits in the sense that um, they can just, yeah, take longer for their for their study. Um, and also there is few interventions for the institution. So there is few possibilities to switch among programs. Huh? So, um, yeah, there is, is few progress uh, and intermediate progressing uh, to students. So this as a bundle, of course, this matters in the sense that um, this output linked funding model is not as effective as you would wish. Um, in the Flemish case. So in general, if you look to the higher education funding um, and um, yeah, what, what do we learn there? So we observe that in most countries, only a small proportion of funding is performance-based, except for Ireland, um, in which there is a, a massive amount. And so this happens uh, after this Dutch um, case. So in Ireland, about 10% of the funding is uh, performance-based funding. But overall, we don't find in this literature a strong impact um, and yeah, of, of similar performance-based fundings in the same line that it's quite difficult to avoid the perverse effects. And so um, from higher stakes, yeah, if, if, if you get a lot of money, yeah, you increase the stakes for the system and it's becoming more and more important to, to, to switch this. So if, if you have a very narrow set of indicators, for instance, yeah, you indicate a lot of time to those indicators. Okay, so this brings me to the fourth and last part of the presentation about the, the access to higher education. Um, access to higher education, why is this a very important issue? Yeah, because of this graph. So this graph shows that um, what is the percentage of students coming from a particular background entering higher education? And you see for both Estonia and for Flanders that we're not doing particularly well. So in, um, in Estonia, for instance, if your parents didn't complete, that's this bar here, if your parents didn't complete second education, only 26% of the children will go to higher education. And so you see that, yeah, th there is a, a few people and a few persons without a, and a few parents without an, uh, an higher education degree that can send their kids to higher education. And of course, this deals with socioeconomic status, this deals with income, this deals with education track. 
Um, if your parents are coming from a tertiary education, you see that it increases dramatically the probabilities of enter higher education. So if the parents had a higher education degree, yeah, about 70%, 75% of the parents uh, of their children will eventually enter um, higher education. So you see that this is a, yeah, a kind of intergenerational mobility, which is relatively low in both Estonia as well as in Flanders. So the access to higher education, this depends on a, on a few elements. So the performance of the secondary education system. And so it's already the tertiary level. Inequality is typically put in place in a very low education level. So in kindergarten and primary education. And so everything which comes before matters um, to some extent. Um, it depends on the, the requirements and the pathways. And so if there are multiple pathways to enter higher education, um, you, you reduce the levels and you, you increase intergenerational mobility. The same for the requirements, sociocultural factors, but of course also the financial support to students. And this links of course to the, to the, to the funding mechanism, to the loans and to the grants, as well as to the funding to the institutions. And with respect to the loans, um, this is a graph in which I compared the, the loans and the graphs for different education systems. And again, this OECD graph. But you see from uh, Estonia that there are few grants and loans. Um, and all of the system is basically, again, grants and loans, which is very similar to the Flemish system in which there all of the money also going to loans and, and uh, scholarships, to, to uh, grants and scholarships, not to loans. Um, and that's different from many other education systems. So like in the Netherlands, uh, like in uh, the UK, for instance, in Norway and Sweden, a large part of the money is going through loans. And the difference, of course, is that, yeah, in a grant system, it's non-repayable. The student gets the money and he or she doesn't have to repay. In a loan system, it's the government who creates a kind of fund to the student, but it's typically expected that under particular circumstances, the, the student has to repay this loan. And that's what you don't see in uh, Estonia as in Flanders. We do have uh, systems with um, grants and loan and and and, and uh, grants and uh, scholarships without loans. But in Estonia, it's relatively low amounts of money um, that is given there. How does it work in the Flemish system? So we do have study grants. The study grants they are based on family income criteria, like um, the average that the family earns, the, the father and the mother, for instance. Um, it depends also on the number of credits that the student is enrolled. Um, if you just have a very small amount of credits, you won't receive the full grant. Um, and then you get like on average 1,800 um, euros in university colleges, 1,900 euros in universities. So it's significantly more than the tuition fees because it, it covers also, um, for instance, accommodation, uh, books, uh, a laptop, et cetera. There are also tuition fee reductions. Uh, for some students, but there are no loans. Next to what students get, we do have also aid to the institutions directly. And that's again in this formula. So in the formula that I discussed you a moment ago, if there are students from particular target groups, then the formula assigns an additional weight to those students such that the institution is also rewarded for that because we know that the institution has more costs to, towards students from a lower socioeconomic background. For instance, they have to teach them more, they have more private classes, um, they have more mentoring and coaching, uh, more facilities. And that's why the institution is also compensated for that, but also of course, as a kind of incentive to, to hire or to accept similar students in the institution. And next to that, towards this direct financial institutional support, there is also indirect financial uh, support, which comes in the form of student services. Um, and those student services, they are like of kind of operating grants, um, which is a considerable amount of money, about 50 million euros annually. And this goes to housing, to catering, to social services, to transport, et cetera. Um, all with the idea to, to create a kind of inclusive university in which students from different backgrounds can come and in which there are uh, yeah, compensations for the housing, for instance, or social services for particular groups of uh, students. Yeah, And that's a little bit how the system works in Flanders. So both the grants are important um, as well as the direct and indirect um, uh, yeah, compensations for the students. Well, I guess this brings me to the end of the presentations. Um, if you would like to dig a bit deeper into this um, this materials to see even more graphs, um, I would definitely 
direct you towards those two publications from the OCD. They are very interesting and inspiring for this higher education funding. And I'm looking forward to uh, any questions at the end of the presentation and the end of the, uh, of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Um, yeah, just to remind you, the participants, I see already that in Q and A's we have six questions proposed. Feel free to type them in in any time. So we have this like ten additional minutes that me and Trin will discuss a bit of the Estonian case and the light of this Christoph findings, and and then we go to the Q and A. I will try to share my screen. So let's see how successful I am. Uh, hopefully, I am. So, uh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to reflect back, I guess all this project, uh, what we are doing here, or, or the this webinar is part of this project, is very much dedicated not only how much to be, uh, uh, how much public funds universities need, but also this incentive and mechanism or how to distribute money to universities. And uh, I guess our main finding, of course, was a, a kind of comparative, uh, I don't know, the latest of slides now we're working very well. So the comparative view uh, that, that Estonia, small red dot on the left-hand side of this figure is indicating that, that we are among all this, what I will call post-Soviet uh, regimes of education financing, where students are by large extent neglected. So by, inspired by this kind of final part of Christoph talk, um, that the st student financing is, has been very much performance and merit-based in most of those post-Soviet um, systems. So the access and, and also even the fact that university education is correlating with socioeconomic status and, uh, and of course the social mobility it can be a key issue in society is not very much debated. So uh, what this red small dot shows is that all red dots are those systems who rely mostly on performance-based grants and by a smaller extent to the need-based grants. And all the blue dots are those, and among of those are is also the Flemish part of Belgium where we have only need-based grants. Of course, um, we, I guess those who, are involved in higher education know that UK is a, a extraordinary case, not only regarding to the amount of fees, but also uh, regarding to this uh, uh, differently set student financing system, which is relying on, on loans. And also, um, by my great surprise, the one foundation I uh, I'm about to share with you with regarding to the student loans, the system which has been in place for many decades in Estonia is seemingly a, a very inefficient and untrusted by, uh, by families or students themselves. So the, the students don't use our loan system. So what they have as a part of student financing is mainly performance-based grants. So it's a very meritocratic system. So, um, the small dot here is not showing that we don't have annual fees are at all. I mean, this very small red dot. It's just we didn't know what is the uh, the uh, uh, median size of the fee because those who are familiar with the student system they know that we have conditional. Uh, fees in the university, meaning that if you take the full program to keep it simple and take the uh, uh, and study in a student curriculum, then there is no fees. In the rest of the cases, you have to pay fees. But let's also uh, look at the the empirical evidence which are coming from the literature and those sources are the most recent funds first, and we are relying on, on a set of the studies which try to be experimental or semi-experimental. It means that we at least 
uh, have a certain methodologies to to show the the outcomes of the of the different finding mechanisms to the outcomes of the students. So first, um, regarding fees, what we know from the literature is that fees alone don't have much impact on enrollment. So even though there is a debate that it's not only fees zero one type of a a, a, a dummy variable, but it's also the the size of the fees, how high they are, which has to be uh, considered, but there is no clear evidence on the size. What regards need-based grants, there is increasing evidence that, that this size of the grants and uh, the early the grant starts matters for the effect effectiveness of this policy. So, and the effective this means uh, increase of the enrollment rates, especially regarding disadvantaged students. So as you can see, there is new evidence that performance-based grants uh, somehow increase student access or uh, enrollment or graduation rates. So, or graduation with nominal times was often stressed here in Estonia. So we don't have this evidence. Uh, as was also, uh, stressed by Christia, we have evidence that the lower levels count, meaning that the school's social mix can have stronger effect on aspirations of students and socioeconomic status. So what happens in the lower levels of education uh, regarding a, a segregation in higher education and social mobility regarding to that counts. And, uh, and also that is not much debated in Estonia, the, the final part of, of Christia's talk, about the, the uh, indirect uh, measures for, for uh, support of the students. Here they are just named as outreach policies. And there is a increasing evidence that they matter and active guidance counseling and student services, uh, which are not just providing a general education or information, but just also going into more student uh, uh, student services such as um, uh, counseling, psychological counseling, uh, and all those count. And we have only evidence from US uh, where they deal a bit more with the cost effectiveness of policies that actually we know that, that um, early childcare policies are the most cost effective, but even if you go to the uh, to the higher levels of education, then all child-related investments are cost-effective. So this is a short overview of the of the introduction of political arena, and now I will give the floor to Trin, who is coming from the um, side of the polit political science, and and what we haven't debated too much. Uh, so far is what actually voters want and why the what those voters want or what are the voters preferences over the higher education are highly endogenous to the system. So Trin, the I will mute myself to avoid background noise, but you have to guide me. Take the yeah, next slide. I will. Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah, thank okay. you, Kara. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> And hello, everybody. Yes, when educational economists ask what works for different types of educational outcomes, then political scientists mainly ask, ask who get the what, when, and how. So basically, this political science-based questions, uh, not just to look at the voters preferences. And of course, uh, when we assume that voters' preferences are important, then at the same, then also the question, what drives those preferences is very, very important. And from the literature, we know that actually education is special from that perspective that, that different, differently from other social policy areas, actually, in case of education, uh, higher social economic uh, status um, voters prefer uh, lean state. Uh, 
also, we know from this uh, same literature that ideology matters, uh, uh, that actually left leaners prefer more state involvement in, in the educational provision. But perhaps most interestingly, from the perspective of today's uh, talk, we also know that actually existing institutions matter, uh, which we call policy feedback effect. In other words, uh, how the education is governed or provided and funded in a particular country, it uh, influences how voters or citizens perceive uh, education and at the same time also influences our preferences. For instance, uh, dependent on how education is funded, there are different types of winners and losers. So uh, utility maximizers <laughs> uh, uh, vote accordingly. Also, it might be the case that uh, interpretation or ideology matters in that perspective that for instance, if you live in heavily privately provided educational context, uh, then you learn to love <laughs> that system, even if you know that it might cause uh, educational inequality. So it, it's somehow policy leg legitimizes itself. And, and what we do now, uh, we will walk you through very briefly, we'll, we'll, through some, some descriptive data about educational preferences in different countries, included Estonia. So Kyra, will you just help us to, yeah. And uh, thanks to uh, Tallinn University uh, or thanks to the col collaborative project between Constance University and Tallinn University, um, uh, we have this opportunity to analyze educational preferences uh, of Estonian citizens, and this data was collected as part of the wider survey ISSP, and it had one specific uh, education module called Inveduk. And, um, and we took, uh, or now we take uh, four separate questions, uh, one about private schooling. So whether you prefer private schooling to play an important role, whether you prefer private universities to play an important role, whether you want government to fund private schools and whether you think, uh, um, think uh, parental opportunity to choose is a good thing. And we compose one index based on those four different sub questions and we will get one index, Kyra, next slide. <laughs> uh, we will have one index per person and we call this educational preferences. The higher the index, the more conservative educational preferences are, meaning you are more pro-private provision, you are more pro-choice and the lower the index is, you are more pro public funding and, and less more, less uh, <laughs> pro private uh, provision. And uh, let's focus on the lower right uh, figure here, uh, where you'll see educational preferences across nine European countries, Sweden, Italy, Ireland, Great Britain, France, Estonia, Spain, Denmark, and Germany. And surprisingly, or perhaps not, we see that actually Estonia together with Ireland is among the, the highest score. In other words, Estonians prefer uh, private provision in education. Uh, the left lower panel uh, at the same time shows us what are Estonians and others <laughs> respondents uh, across other countries uh, preferences regarding political parties. Again, the lower the number, the more left-leaning are political preferences, the higher the number, the more right-leaning are political preferences. preferences. And again, uh, we see that Estonia is, uh, has the highest 
uh, score, which means that in Estonia, voters have the most right-leaning preferences. So the main takeaway here is that based on that data, we see that actually Estonians are relatively pro uh, private provision in, uh, in education system. Uh, and these upper panels, colorful pictures, just shows the distribution of, of those uh, uh, educational preferences scores across um, uh, across uh, so whether it's a normally distributed and you will see that in many countries actually there are, there are many peaks that are more left-leaning and more right-leaning voters however in Estonia we saw only one peak actually <laughs> which is right-leaning peak. Kyra, next slide. However you might, might argue that when you put everything together basic schooling, higher education choice, it's, uh, it's not very informative. Let's take one educational level at a time. And here on that figure, you see uh, educational preferences across those same nine European countries, including Estonia, uh, regarding higher education. And the upper panel asks whether government should support students, yes or no. And you see that actually, while we see that the actually the variance across countries is not very high, everybody wants more student support. However, Estonia is among the highest, uh, highest um, uh, level. When we ask who should get actually that support, whether it should be based on the need, so the low uh, socioeconomic status students should get that fee, then Estonia is some, somewhat in the middle. When we ask whether the ones who show the best results uh, should get the student to support then Estonia again very meritocratic very strongly believe that we should uh, yeah we should uh, give fees to those students who show best best results the middle panel in the middle ask whether government should allow uh, tuition fees at higher education level here uh, Estonia is um, yeah, somewhat in the middle. Uh, and again, when we ask who should pay those tuition fees, whether richer, then the answer is no. No, Estonians don't think, think that the uh, richer people should pay tuition fees. When we ask whether those ones who doesn't who do not show very good results, uh, they should pay tuition fees, then Estonia again in the middle. Okay, and finally, uh, uh, we have this lower panel where we asked whether private higher education should play an important role in country's education system. Then again, we see that actually, or not again, but, but uh, when in the combined score, we saw that actually Estonians are very right-leaning and very pro-private schooling. Then somewhat surprisingly, at higher education level, we see that, that the score is relatively low compared to Ireland, UK, and, and other countries. Finally, we have one <laughs> additional figure about uh, whether, what actually parties want and, and whether parties are ready to deliver uh, education to, to citizens. And here, what we do, we map uh, positive mentions, either education or welfare policies in party manifestos of Estonian parliament election across all elections. And of course, you can understand that welfare policy actually is much wider term compared to education policies. And that, that's why in most of the countries, the uh, mentions of welfare policies is many times higher compared to education mentions, which 
in other words, the welfare policy, welfare policies have much higher salience compared to Estonian pol education policies, sorry. And this is also the case in Estonia. However, we see that in 1999, uh, Reform Party, but also Conservative uh, Isama or ERL actually mentioned education more compared to welfare policies. And we also see the same trend in 2015, where Reform Party actually mentioned education twice as much compared to welfare policies, which are which is actually extraordinary <laughs> in, in, in the perspective of other countries. Thank you. And I'm happy to open up the discussion. Now I have the honor to give the floor to Jürgen Ligi, who was so kind to comment our presentations and have uh, a few insights from the policy perspective. So Jürgen, the, uh, the screen is yours. I will mute myself not to create any background noise. Thank you. Uh, I hope I have heard, but uh, I don't know whether I, I, I've seen, I have problems with with camera and everything here. Uh, but uh, probably there is not much to add uh, from political level. Uh, the presentations were very interesting and, uh, and uh, much more complicated than the political debate in Estonia actually is. Uh, talking only about higher education and, and financing the, the, the whole idea of, um, uh, of almost all parties is that it should be free and then no more details and, um, and uh, the budget uh, remains low uh, after this so-called reform uh, to make it free there hasn't been uh, added uh, much uh, state uh, financing. So the problem is, is clear. My own position is different from the average. I think um, financing should be shared and student, uh, students uh, should be involved on, on every level. And, and, uh, uh, and then the starting point uh, should be that students uh, have to pay, and after that, there, there, there should be exclusions, uh, depending on some uh, some details. But, uh, but generally, yes, the political debate in, in Estonia is very simple: uh, no fees, and and that's all. But that's the conclu my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll take over from here and and uh, uh, I have the role of the moderator of the session and and uh, there, as I see, there is open uh, in uh, question and answer session. There is six questions proposed, and uh, uh, I don't know um, how is the good way of going regarding to the time, we have approximately 15 minutes. So uh, maybe there is, um, I tried to uh, first address questions to, uh, to Chris. There are some questions regarding Flanders system and, uh, and there is a question about the click system. Uh, that, that how it works and is it a legal mechanism? Uh, meaning, is it mandatory to government to follow it? Um, and there is also other questions. Uh, is there more detailed view of Landers R&D by fields, for example? Uh, there has been a public criticism that the Estonian science system is out of sync with the need, uh, needs of the economy of society. So I guess, uh, those are the, the two questions regarding to the family system. Uh, Christoph, can you yes. take over and try to answer them? 
Thank you very much. There are also two questions I, where I uh, already typed a kind of answer, so they are within the uh, answered questions. And let me first uh, come back to the to what uh, Jurgen Ligi said about the financing, because of course, um, yeah, if the if the debate nowadays is in Estonia more about um, it should be completely for free the education system, um, I share this vision that uh, yeah that you should share the burden between private as well as public budgets. Um, because the benefits, um, the private benefits of a tertiary degree are, are significant, both in terms of unemployment, what I showed you the graph for, as well as in terms of wages. So once you obtain this tertiary education degree, yeah, you get huge private benefits and um, a system in which you have higher tuition fees with a kind of loan, of course, or something similar. Yeah, this might be quite beneficial both for society because you, you aim for as many people as possible to higher education, but you, you reduce a little bit the pure private benefits as well. And so in that sense, I shared the, um, the vision that Jürgen just said uh, about sharing this, uh, yeah, this budget. With respect to the questions, so first uh, question that I uh, try to answer is uh, one of the criticisms in universities in Estonia is um, that universities compete uh, with the same programs in the same area. Um, and this was actually, that's what I added in the chat. This was actually a very interesting paper that I sh shared with you um, from my colleagues Frank Verboven and the same Kelchermans that show, and the title says already the results, program duplication is not necessarily bad. Um, and they show that um, if you duplicate programs, contrary to what you would expect a priori, a priori you would say, yeah, if you have two types of programs in higher education, um, closely to each other with the same outcomes, yeah, um, you should try to, to focus it better. Um, what they showed in their paper is that, particularly in the bachelor years, that more of those more generic bachelors uh, increase participation in higher education because the costs to participate in the higher education system for um, young students and definitely for the social economic disadvantaged students um, is very high if you have very specialized bachelor programs. This differs in the masters where they show that yeah, in the masters you can have more specialization because the cost of specific um, outcomes are, are different. But so that's an, a first reply. Um, I'll, I'll send you this uh, link to the, to the paper. If you can't access it, let me know, then I'll send you the, the paper. Second um, is about the, the purchasing power parities. Um, yes, indeed, in the graphs that I showed you from the OECD, there is no purchasing power parity in the sense that, um, that there are differences between systems, of course, in terms of expenses. Um, I'll share the link with World Bank data uh, or also education at the glance data where they compensate with that. And then, yeah, you see indeed that there is a, a smaller difference um, between uh, education systems uh, once you account for the purchasing power. Uh, but still, there are differences. Huh? And that's the interesting thing that's remained. With respect to the R&D, um, there are... Um, yeah, differences in terms of R&D. So in the Flemish system, we try to look a little bit to society as well as to fundamental research. So both elements are as important to each other. So both the, the non-directed um, research, and that's basically organized by um, basic research uh, proposals. So we are allowed to, to, to provide our own uh, research proposal to the Flemish science organization that is then funding it. Um, or not, eh? so it depends on peer review. But so that's that's really bottom up. And this aims for fundamental research with no specific reason. And then on top of that, there is also kind of top down research or research with societal impacts. And so both elements are different streams in the research funding, in which you can have real fundamental research with no specific outcome to society yet. Uh, fundamental research in which there have to be uh, society stakeholders involved or industry stakeholders, and then also very applied research. And uh, this combination is relatively successful. Um, and I have to say also Leuven University is quite successful. So if you're interested in that, you have to have a look to the, the website of Leuven Research and Development. That's like an, um, an organization which is the, the main administration for projects and funding in, uh, in the University of Leuven. And they are a kind of European best practice um, in, in how to organize spin-offs towards industry, um, towards uh, all kind of society and towards um, uh, society leveraging, etc. And that's yeah, how we try to, to make sure that there is a sufficient alignment between what universities do and what um, society would like to have. Um, there was a question about the Voyagers as well and how Voyagers would work. 
Um, yeah, Voyagers, um, that's a, education economics says that Voyagers are a very good system in the sense that it allows people um, for it, it's a non distortive incentive. Eh? So it doesn't distort the incentives. You can prove this. And if you have Voyagers, it works basically like a kind of feed voting. Eh? So it, it, the money follows the students. And if an institution is better than the other institution, you expect that more people will come to this institution. And so more voyagers will be brought in into this institution. And as such, um, it feed votes and the bad institutions are pushed away or uh, there are less popular such that they have to increase the, um, the, their, uh, their way of teaching, for instance. Um, and as such, indeed, yeah, um, voyagers are typically considered as an effective mechanism to, uh, to broaden access as well as to, to increase competition in the, in the system. There was a question about the click system. It's a legal mechanism indeed. So it's, uh, it's mandatory. It's um, written in a degree. So it's written in the law and um, it's followed. It's automatically followed. Um, it's very difficult for the Ministry of Education to change this. Um, they can, if in terms of austerity, for instance, the ministry can play with other variables they can for instance say we, we won't we will reduce a bit of fund, the research funding but this uh, mechanism or, or they they play a bit with the inflation eh? so they don't compensate for inflation for instance that's what they do but changing the click system it's quite difficult because of course also the yeah the institutions they yeah they account for that eh? or they they would like to to see if there is an increase of two percent of the student body yeah they would like to see also this increase in terms of funding and that's why it's mandatory and it's automatically followed uh, by the government. And they know, of course, beforehand. So they see this coming. They see, yeah, it's already 1% increased, 1.5% on next year. There will be an increase in the in this click system. And that's how they, uh, they know this for budgetary reasons. Um, there was a question also on the, the outcome and outputs indicators, and that this is possible for teaching as well. That's completely true. Eh? So um, in teaching, the, the quality indicators, they are, for instance, uh, the national student survey in the Netherlands. Eh? So every student is required or asked at the end of the year to fill out how satisfied are you with the course and, and what you did. And um, that's a kind of quality indicator for students. Um, in the Flemish case, that's more like the completion rates. We don't have this national student survey, but in the Netherlands are definitely a best practice um, in which yeah, this is, was part of this performance indicators to measure the quality of teaching through those um, self-questionnaires of students. And then finally, there was a, a question on the autonomy uh, of universities and the managing uh, on how you, you can account for that. So the, the, the link with uh, the tax systems, um, this was one of the ideas in, uh, in performance-based funding in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, they, they had this idea to be, we will fund within this 5% of performance-based funding, we will fund for both the teaching as well as the valorization and the mission. And so it was up to the universities and the university colleges to define their own mission. If this, was, if this mission was sufficiently distinct from others, and if this mission was also sufficiently clear in terms of valorization and, and the, the merits to society, then you could have more funding than in other, educate, than other universities. So this, um, what uh, Tunis Ferry here, uh, I pronounce it well, I hope, uh, says about the similarities within the tech systems. So that's exactly what, um, what the aim was from this uh, Dutch performance-based funding. And in the end, as I said, it worked relatively well. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that it's yeah similar qualitative evidence. It, it's difficult to see, uh, and it's difficult to define when will you when will you fund a particular mission. Uh? So that's why we had very difficult discussions within the within the review commission to to see what is sufficient distance, how does it align sufficient to a society. Um, but the idea indeed was that universities were autonomous and that the, the money would follow if you had good ideas. For that, I guess that I. By that, I, I answered most of the questions. Uh... Yeah, maybe we can address also the your own feeling about this low tuition fee, the question of Aunevalk, the last one. I, I, I guess there was this debate that the cost sharing is kind of good policy in the sense that, that there are private benefits related with education. There are clear private benefits. So well, I guess the debate, from zero to 1,000 tuition fee is just a question of principle, isn't it? But then the question above it is also pretty interesting. How far can we go? Yeah, 
Yeah, and I, I don't know really the evidence on that, so I should look, but I guess there is a rich literature on tuition fees. Um, in, in the case of Flanders, this is definitely an ethical question. It's a political question. Um, we do have low tuition fees, 1,000 euros. Um, it, it increased already significantly, as you've seen in the graph. So it was like 500 euros in the past. Um, it increased significantly because of, um, yeah, to, 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 to guarantee sufficient access and to make sure that yeah, the, the, the universities and University of Applied Science are sufficiently funded um, by adding this private component. But still, if you compare it to the Netherlands, where the tuition fees is about 1,800 euros, um, if you compare it to the UK, where they are incredibly high, um, yeah, in the UK, for instance, looking to and, and speaking with uh, chancellors in the UK, this is not a good practice as well. So you get a huge competition for the students, not based on the contents, but mainly based on the facilities, on the sports, uh, and all kind of other things that don't really matter for academic for academic success or for academic uh, outcomes. Um, and so I guess this is yeah the the other extreme whether it has to be completely private and, and, and public um, and, and, and without tuition fees, like in some countries, I, I don't think so as well. So I guess there is a kind of middle ground, but this is more like an, um, yeah, an, an personal opinion. Uh, I should really look to the literature on what is saying, but the literature is clear on the private benefits. Eh? So, and that's what we bring into the debates in Flanders nowadays. The private benefits of tertiary education are, are huge. Um, there are significant societal benefits as well, um, but yeah, this is why we would like to have a low fee, but to some extent also to skim a little bit this, uh, this huge private benefits. Thanks. There is one new question emerged from uh, a Minister of, uh, of uh, Higher Education Research about the vouchers again. I guess it seems to be a kind of increasingly important topic. Uh, regarding to the uh, to the concern that that the students tend to prefer social sciences, law, human and humanities programs, uh, if the voucher programs are equally distributing money to the to the students. So, do you have any any empirical evidence on that, or do you remind any studies regarding to that? Yeah, so on. Um, so we have the same issue, for instance, in Flanders, in which yeah, there, there, we would like to have more students coming to the STEM education, uh, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, we try to do this by orienting students better, uh, so by having a kind of intake tests and, and showing what kind of outcomes do you have, uh, by showing what is the labor market prospect, what, are, what happens in terms of wages. And so by shifting the mindset of students already as at a young age. Uh, so one of the conditions to enter higher education, as I showed you before, is, is secondary education. Uh, so the, the study track, um, the enrollment in secondary education, uh, triggering the interest of students. Um, and I don't think you can... Yeah, it's a bit, bit too late to, to change it at the age of 18 years old um, and even through Voyager's programs because of, yeah, students, they typically take a program because of their interest, because of what they think is interesting. And all of those foundations is already laid earlier before in secondary education. So rather than playing with the Voyagers, um, I would think that, um, yeah, you, 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 you have to start earlier and, and to trigger the interest there. Um, to show the merits of STEM education, for instance, of, of mathematical education, um, already at a younger age. But that's, of course, a discussion which happens in many countries. Eh? So I, I'm, I'm sure there is a plenty of research, um, and definitely on STEM, eh? so how to, to make sure that people choose for STEM, eh? because that's an issue that you have in many countries, that um, there's too little students that, that choose for engineering programs, whereas too many students choose for psychology progr uh, programs. And so that's an, an it's a topical issue anyway in literature, um, but I guess it's, it's it has to start at a young age. Yeah, yeah and it's super interesting that you mentioned more like uh, the counseling services instead of this kind of monetary incentives. I guess the student take on it. You have to pay students more in the STEM uh, curricula to kind of lure them to the programs, and this is very different. Again, we are relying very much on this performance-based uh, based grants instead of need-based grants. So the take on higher education, I guess, has this very post-Soviet roots. Um, I guess time-wise, we're doing fine, aren't we? Uko, 
can you take over uh, and steal the screen for us? Otherwise, we can continue forever. Yeah, I have to say the time is running past and we have to start concluding our seminar. I think a very sort of broad spectrum of, of topics were covered from these uh, general trends to the specific uh, student loan systems and politi also political preferences, which was really interesting for me. I think that the, the webinar highlighted some, some of the major differences and also the challenges the Estonian system is, is facing, but also give us some fresh ideas how to, to enrich our local debate. So I think it was really valuable. So thanks to all the panelists and participants, and especially Kaire for moderating the discussion. By the way, I counted all your 1.1 publications in ETIS, so I know it was an impressive number. <laughs> So I hope you all enjoyed the discussion as much as I did, and I wish you all a very nice evening. So bye-bye.